book one chapter twelve of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter twelve of the first acts of the most holy soul of christ our lord in the first instant of his conception and of the corresponding acts of his most pure mother in order to understand what were the first acts of the most holy soul of christ our lord we must refer to that which has been said in the preceding chapter namely that all that substantially belonged to this divine mystery the formation of the body the creation and the infusion of the soul and the union of the individual humanity with the person of the word happened and was completed in one act or instant that we cannot say that in any moment of time christ our highest good was only man for from the first instant he was man and true god as soon as his humanity arrived at being man he was also god therefore he could not at any time be called a mere man not for one instant but from the very beginning he was god man or man god and as the active exercise of the faculties is coexistent with operative essences therefore the most holy soul of christ our lord in the same instant in which the incarnation took place was beatified by intuitive vision and love according to our way of speaking the powers of his intellect and will immediately united with the divinity itself for his human essence joined the divinity in one instant by hypostatic union and thus his human faculties in their most perfect activity were united with the essence of god himself so that both in essence and in operation he was entirely deified the wonder about this sacrament is that so much glory yea the greatness of the immense divinity was enclosed within such a small compass not larger than the body of a bee or not greater than a small almond for the dimension of the most holy body of christ was not any greater than that at the instant when the conception and hypostatic union took place moreover in this small compass was included the highest glory as well as the capability for suffering for the humanity was at the same time glorified and also passable it was both a comprehensor and a viator possessing heaven though yet on his pilgrimage to heaven god however in his infinite power and wisdom could thus contract himself and enclose his infinite deity within the sphere of a body thus minute by a new and admirable mode of existence without in the least ceasing to be god by the same omnipotence he provided that this most holy soul of christ in its superior faculties and in its most noble operations should be in the state of glory and enjoying beatitude while all this immense glory was at the same time compressed as it were into the superior parts of his soul suspending the effects and gifts of glory that would otherwise naturally have communicated themselves to his body on this account he could be at the same time a viator subject to suffering enabling him to procure our salvation by means of his cross passion and death in order to be fully equipped for these and for whatever the most holy humanity was to perform all the habits natural to his faculties and necessary for their activity and operation both as comprehensor and as viator were infused into it at the moment of his conception thus he was furnished with the infused science of the blessed with the sanctifying grace and the gifts of the holy ghost which according to isaiah rested upon the christ isaiah chapter eleven verse two he possessed all the virtues except faith and hope for these are incompatible with the beatific vision and possession and were wanting in him likewise were wanting in the holy of the holy ones all other virtues which presuppose any imperfection since he could not sin nor was deceit found in his mouth first letter of peter chapter two verse twenty two the dignity and excellence of his science and grace the virtues and perfections of christ our lord need not be mentioned here for that is taught by the sacred doctors and masters of theology in a profuse manner for me it is sufficient to state that all this was as perfect as was possible to the divine power and that it cannot be encompassed by human understanding for the most holy soul of christ drank from the very fountain of the divinity psalm thirty five verse ten 
and could do so without limit or retrenchment as david says psalm 109 verse 7 therefore he must have been possessed of the plentitude of all virtues and perfections thus adorned and deified by the divinity and its gifts the most holy soul of christ our lord proceeded in its operations in the following order immediately it began to see and know the divinity intuitively as it is in itself and as it is united to his most holy humanity loving it with the highest beatific love and perceiving the inferiority of the human nature in comparison with the essence of god the soul of christ humiliated itself profoundly and in this humility it gave thanks to the immutable being of god for having created it and for the benefit of the hypostatic union by which though remaining human it was raised to the essence of god it also recognized that his most holy humanity was made capable of suffering and was adapted for attaining the end of the redemption in this knowledge it offered itself as the redeemer in sacrifice for the human race psalm thirty nine verse eight accepting the state of suffering and giving thanks in his own name and in the name of mankind to the eternal father he recognized the composition of his most holy humanity the substance of which it was made and how most holy mary by the force of her charity and of her heroic virtues furnished its substance he took possession of this holy tabernacle and dwelling rejoicing in its most exquisite beauty and well pleased reserved as his own property the soul of this perfect and most pure creature for all eternity he praised the eternal father for having created her and endowed her with such vast graces and gifts for having exempted her and freed her from the common law of sin as his daughter while all the other descendants of adam have incurred its guilt romans chapter five verse eighteen he prayed for the most pure lady and for saint joseph asking eternal salvation for them all these acts and many others were most exalted and proceeded from him as true god and man not taking into account those that pertain to the beatific vision and love these acts and each one by itself were of such merit that they alone would have sufficed to redeem infinite worlds if such could exist even the act of obedience alone by which the most holy humanity of the word subjected itself to suffering and prevented the glory of his soul from being communicated to his body was abundantly sufficient for our salvation but although this sufficed for our salvation nothing would satisfy his immense love for men except the full limit of effective love john chapter thirteen verse one for this was the purpose of his life that he should consume it in demonstrations and tokens of such intense love that neither the understanding of men nor of angels was capable of comprehending it and if in the first instant of his entrance into the world he enriched it so immeasurably what treasures what riches of merits must he have stored up for it when he left it by his passion and death on the cross after thirty-three years of labor and activity all divine o oh, immense love o oh, charity without limit o oh, mercy without measure o oh, most generous kindness and on the other hand o oh, ingratitude and base forgetfulness of mortals in the face of such unheard of and such vast benefaction what would have become of us without him how much less could we do for this our redeemer and lord even if he had conferred on us but small favors while now we are scarcely moved and obliged by his doing for us all that he could if we do not wish to treat as a redeemer him who has given us eternal life and liberty let us at least hear him as our teacher let us follow him as our leader as our guiding light which shows us the way to our true happiness this lord and master did not work for himself nor did he preempt his soul nor gain this augmentation of grace for himself but entirely for us he had no need of all this nor could he receive an increase of grace or glory since he was filled with them john chapter one verse fourteen as st john says for he was the only begotten of the father at the same time that he was man in this he had no equal nor could he have an imitator 
all the saints and mere creatures gained merits for themselves and labored for reward the love of christ alone was without self-interest and altogether for us and if he wished to enter and go through the school of bodily experience of this life luke chapter two verse fifty two it was in order to teach us and enrich us by his obedience hebrews chapter five verse eight while he turned over to us his infinite merits and his example in order that we might be wisely instructed in the art of loving for this is not learned perfectly by affection and desire unless it is truly and effectively practiced in deeds i do not enlarge upon the mysteries of the most holy life of christ our lord on account of my incapacity and i refer to the gospels selecting only that which will seem necessary for the heavenly history of his mother our lady for the lives of this son and his most holy mother are so intimately connected and intertwined with each other that i cannot avoid making references to the gospels and besides add other facts which are not mentioned by them concerning the lord and which are not necessary in their narratives for the first ages of the catholic church these operations of christ our lord in the first instant of his conception were followed in another essential instant by the beatific vision of the divinity which we have mentioned in the preceding chapter for in one instant of time many instants of essence can take place in this vision the heavenly lady perceived with clearness and distinction the mystery of the hypostatic union of the divine and the human natures in the person of the eternal word and the most holy trinity confirmed her in the title and the rights of mother of god this in all rigor of truth she was since she was the natural mother of a son who was eternal god with the same certainty and truth as he was man although this great lady did not directly cooperate in the union of the divinity with the humanity she did not on this account lose her right to be called the mother of the true god for she concurred by administering the material and by exerting her faculties as far as it pertained to a true mother and to a greater extent than to ordinary mothers since in her the conception and the generation took place without the aid of a man just as in other generations the agents which bring them about in the natural course are called father and mother each furnishing that which is necessary without however concurring directly in the creation of the soul nor in its infusion into the body of the child so also and with greater reason most holy mary must be called and did call herself mother of god for she alone concurred in the generation of christ true god and man as a mother to the exclusion of any other natural cause and through this concurrence of mary in the generation christ the man god was born the virgin mother of christ also understood in this vision the future mysteries of the life and death of her sweetest son and of the redemption of the human race together with those of the new law of the gospel which was to be established in connection therewith to her were also manifested other great and profound secrets which were made known to none other of the saints the most prudent queen seeing herself thus in the immediate presence of the deity and furnished with the plenitude of divine gifts and science as became the mother of the word lost in humility and love adored the lord in his infinite essence and without delay also in its union with the most holy humanity she gave him thanks for having favored her with the dignity of mother of god and for the favors done to the whole human race she gave thanks and glory also for all the mortals she offered herself as an acceptable sacrifice in his service in the rearing up and nourishing of her sweetest son ready to assist and cooperate as far as on her part it would be possible in the work of the redemption and the holy trinity accepted and appointed her as the coadjutrix in this sacrament she asked for new graces and divine light for this purpose and for directing herself in the worthy ministration of her office as mother of the incarnate word that she might treat him with the veneration and magnanimity due to god himself she offered to her holiest son all the children of adam yet to be born and the saints of limbo and in the name of all and of herself she performed many acts of heroic virtue and asked for great favors which however i will not stop to mention as i have already done in regard to others on different occasions 
for from these it can be easily conjectured what petitions this heavenly queen made on this occasion which so far excelled all the other fortunate and happy days of her previous life but she was especially persistent and fervent in her prayer to obtain guidance of the almighty for the worthy fulfilment of her office as mother of the only begotten of the father for this before all other graces her humble heart urged her to desire and this was especially the subject of her solicitude that she might be guided in all her actions as becomes the mother of god the almighty answered her my dove do not fear for i will assist thee and guide thee directing thee in all things necessary for the service of my only begotten son with this promise she came to herself and issued from her ecstasy in which all that i have said had happened and which was the most wonderful she ever had restored to her faculties her first action was to prostrate herself on the earth and adore her holiest son god and man conceived in her virginal womb for this she had not yet done with her external and bodily senses and faculties nothing that she could do in the service of her creator did this most prudent mother leave undone from that time on she was conscious of feeling new and divine effects in her holiest soul and in her exterior and interior faculties and although the whole tenor of her life had been most noble both as regards her body as her soul yet on this day of the incarnation of the word it rose to still greater nobility of spirit and was made more godlike by still higher reaches of grace and indescribable gifts but let no one think that the purest mother was thus favored and so closely united with the humanity and divinity of her holiest son in order to continue to enjoy spiritual delights and pleasures free from suffering and pain not so for in closest possible imitation of her sweetest son this lady lived to share both joy and sorrow with him the memory of what she had so vividly been taught concerning the labors and the death of her holiest son was like a sword piercing her heart this sorrow was proportionate to the knowledge and love which such a mother had of such a son and which his presence and intercourse so continually recalled to her mind although the whole life of christ and of his most holy mother was a continued martyrdom and suffering like that of the cross and was filled with incessant pain and labors yet in the most pure and loving heart of the heavenly queen there was also this special feature of suffering that to her inward sight as a most loving mother the passion torments ignominies and death of her son were forever present and by this continued sorrow of thirty-three years she took upon herself the long vigil of our redemption and during all this time this sacrament was concealed in her bosom without companionship or alleviation from any creatures with this loving sorrow full of the sweetest anguish she often looked upon her holiest son both before and after his birth and speaking to him from her innermost heart she would repeat these words lord and god of my soul most sweet son of my womb why hast thou given me the position as mother and yet connected with it the sorrowful thought of losing thee leaving me an orphan bereft of thy desirable company scarcely art thou put in possession of a body for thy earthly life when thou art notified of the sentence of a sorrowful death for the rescue of men the first of thy actions is one of superabundant merit in satisfaction for his sins o would that the justice of the eternal father were thereby satisfied and thy sufferings and death fall upon me from my body and blood thou hast composed thine own without which it would not be possible for thee to suffer since thou art the immutable and immortal god if therefore i have furnished thee the instrument or the matter of thy suffering let me too suffer with thee the same death o inhuman sin how being so cruel and the cause of so much evil couldst thou nevertheless be so fortunate that thy repairer should be one who on account of his infinite goodness can make thee a happy fault o oh, my sweetest son and my love who shall be thy guard who shall defend thee from thy enemies o oh, would that it were the will of the father that i guard thee and save thee from death or die in thy company and that thou never leave mine but that which happened to the patriarch abraham shall not now take place genesis chapter twenty two verse eleven 
for the predestined decree shall be executed let the will of the lord be fulfilled these loving sighs were many times repeated by our queen as i shall say farther on and the eternal father accepted them as an agreeable sacrifice while they were the sweetest diversion of her most holy son instruction which our queen and lady gave me my daughter since thou hast by faith and divine light arrived at a knowledge of the grandeur of god and of his ineffable condescension in coming down from heaven for thee and for all the mortals let not this benefit be for the idle and fruitless adore the essence of god with profound reverence and praise him for what thou knowest of his goodness receive not light and grace in vain second letter to the corinthians chapter six verse one and study the encouraging example given by my most holy son and myself in imitation of him as thou hast come to be instructed in it for as he was the true god and i his mother for in so far as he was man his most holy humanity was created let us humiliate ourselves in the remembrance of our lowly human nature and confess the greatness of the divinity greater than any creature can comprehend do this especially when thou receivest the same lord in the holy sacrament in this admirable sacrament my most holy son with divinity and humanity comes to thee and remains with thee in a new and incomprehensible way his great condescension is manifest though it is little taken notice of and respected by mortals nor does it find the return due to such love let then thy acknowledgment be accompanied with as much humility reverence and worship as is possible to thy combined powers and faculties for though they be exerted to the utmost limit they will always fall short of what thou owest to god and of what he deserves and in order that thou mayest as far as possible make up for thy deficiencies offer up that which my most holy son and i have done unite thy spirit and thy affections in union with the church triumphant and militant offering at the same time thy life as a sacrifice and praying that all nations may know confess and adore their true god who became man for all thank him for the benefits which he has conferred and confers on all whether they know him or not whether they confess or repudiate him above all i ask of thee my dearest to do that which is most acceptable to the lord and most pleasing to me that thou grieve and in sweet affection mourn over the gross ignorance and dangerous tardiness of the sons of men over the ingratitude also of the children of the church who having received the light of the divine faith yet live in such interior forgetfulness of the works and benefits of the incarnation yea of god himself and so much so that they seem to differ from infidels only in some ceremonies and external worship they perform these without spirit or heartiness many times offending and provoking the divine justice which they should placate through this ignorance and torpidity it happens that they are not prepared to receive and acquire the true science of the most high they bring upon themselves the loss of the divine light and they deserve to be left in the heavy darkness making themselves more unworthy than the infidels themselves and entailing upon themselves an incomparably greater chastisement mourn over such great damage of thy neighbours and pray for help from the bottom of thy heart and in order that thou mayest put away from thy own self such formidable dangers do not undervalue the favours and benefits which thou receivest nor even under pretence of humility belittle or forget them remember and consider how distant was the journey which the grace of the most high has made in order to call thee psalm eighteen verse seven ponder in thy mind how it has waited upon thee and consoled thee assured thee in thy doubts quieted thee in thy fears ignored and pardoned thy faults multiplied favors caresses and blessings i assure thee my daughter that thou must confess in thy heart that the most high has not done such things with any other generation thou of thyself canst do nothing thou art poor and more useless than others let then thy thanks be greater than that of all the creatures End of chapter twelve
book one chapter thirteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter thirteen an explanation of the state in which most holy mary found herself after the incarnation of the divine word in her virginal womb the deeper i begin to understand the divine effects and conditions which were caused by the conception of the eternal word in the queen of heaven the more i am involved in difficulties of describing this event for i find myself immersed in exalted and complicated mysteries while my intellect and power of expression are entirely insufficient for encompassing what is presented to me nevertheless my soul experiences such great sweetness and such delight in spite of this deficiency that i cannot bring myself to repent entirely of my undertaking at the same time obedience animates me and also compels me to overcome the hardships which in a weak and womanly mind would be insuperable if the assurance and encouragement coming from this source would not assist me this is true especially of this chapter in which i am to treat of the gifts of glory enjoyed by the blessed in heaven taking their prerogatives as models i will try to describe the state of the heavenly empress mary after becoming the mother of god for this purpose i will speak of the blessed from two points of view of their own perfection and of their relation to god as regards the latter the divinity is made clear and manifest to them with all its perfections and attributes this is called the object of their beatitude their glory the substantial joy the ultimate end wherein the whole creature finds its adequate end and rest on the part of the saints there are the beatific operations of vision and love and of others necessarily connected with that most happy state which neither the eyes have seen nor ears have heard nor can enter into the thoughts of men isaiah chapter sixty four verse four first letter to the corinthians chapter two verse twenty nine among the gifts and prerogatives of this glory of the saints some are called endowments freely given as to a spouse entering upon the spiritual matrimony which is consummated in the joys of the eternal felicity just as the earthly spouse acquires possession and dominion of her endowments and enjoys in common with her husband the use of them so also in glory these gifts are made to the saints as their own while their use is common both to them in as far as they themselves rejoice in them and to god in so far as he is glorified in them by the saints and these ineffable gifts are more or less excellent according to the merits and the dignities of each but they are not given to those who are not of the same nature as the spouse namely christ our lord hence only to men not to angels for the incarnate word has not entered into any espousals with the angels hebrews chapter two verse sixteen as he has done with men by uniting himself with them in that great sacrament mentioned by the apostle letter to the ephesians chapter five verse thirty two in christ and in the church since however the bridegroom christ as man is composed of body and soul just like the rest of men therefore both body and soul are to be glorified in his presence and the gifts of glory are both for the body and the soul three of these gifts pertain to the soul and they are called vision comprehension and fruition and four pertain to the body clearness impassibility subtlety and agility and these are properly the effects of intuitive vision overflowing from the glory of the soul in all these gifts our queen mary participated to a certain extent already in this life especially after the incarnation of the word in her virginal womb it is true that these gifts are given to the saints as comprehensors being pledges and dowries of the eternal and imperishable felicity and as it were securities for the unchangeableness of their state on that account they are not conferred upon those still on the way to heaven but upon holy mary these gifts were conferred as a viator hence not as a comprehensor not permanently but from time to time and step by step and with a certain difference as we shall explain in order that the appropriateness of this rare blessing in the sovereign queen may be the better understood 
let that which i have said in the seventh and following chapters before the incarnation be remembered for there the preparation and espousal with which the most high favored his most blessed mother in accordance with her dignity are explained on the day in which the divine lord assumed human nature in her virginal womb this spiritual marriage as far as the heavenly lady is concerned was consummated by that most exalted and exquisite beatific vision which as we have said was then vouchsafed to her but for the other faithful the incarnation was as it were an espousal which is to be consummated in their heavenly fatherland hosea chapter two verse nineteen our great queen possessed another prerequisite for these privileges she was exempt from all stain of original and actual sin and was confirmed in grace by actual impeccability thus she was capable of celebrating this marriage in the name of the church militant and to make promises in the name of all its members letter to the ephesians chapter five verse thirty two for in this matter as she was the mother of the saviour his foreseen merits found their application through her by her transient vision of the glory of the divinity she became the accepted surety for all the children of adam that this same reward will not be denied to any of those who shall use the grace of their redeemer to merit it the divine incarnate word certainly was highly pleased to find that his most burning love and his infinite merits should immediately bear fruit in her who at the same time was his mother his first spouse and the bridal chamber of his divinity and that his rewards should fall upon one in whom there was no hindrance by conferring these privileges and favors upon his most holy mother christ our salvation indulged and partly satiated his love for her and in her for all the mortals too long a delay did it seem to the divine love to wait thirty-three years until he should manifest his divinity to his own mother although he had shown her this favor at other times as related in the first part yet on this occasion of his incarnation he did it in a more excellent manner one which corresponded with the glory of his most holy soul however all this in her was not permanent but renewed from moment to moment with the flow of time in as far as was compatible with the ordinary state of pilgrimage conformable to this god on the day in which most holy mary assumed the position of mother of the eternal word by conceiving him in her womb invested us with a right to our redemption founded upon the espousal of the human nature with himself in the consummation of this spiritual marriage by the beatification of the most holy mary and conferring upon her the gifts of glory the same reward was also promised to us if we should make ourselves worthy of it through the merits of his most holy son our redeemer but so far did the lord raise his mother above all the glory of the saints in the blessings of this day that all the angels and men even in their highest reaches of beatific vision and love cannot attain to that which the heavenly queen then attained the same must also be said of the gifts of glory which overflowed from the soul to her body for all of them corresponded with her innocence holiness and merits and these again corresponded with that highest of all dignities possible to a creature that of being the mother of her creator coming now to these gifts in particular the first gift to her soul was the clear and beatific vision which corresponds to the obscure knowledge of faith in the viators this vision was given to the most holy mary at the times and in the manner already explained and to be explained later besides these intuitive visions she had many other abstractive ones of the divinity of the kind mentioned above although all these were transient yet they left in her mind most exquisite and various images furnishing her with such a clear and exalted knowledge of the divinity that no words can be found to express it in this our lady was singularly privileged before all other creatures and thus she possessed the permanent effects of the gifts of glory as far as compatible with her position as a viator when at times the lord hid himself from her suspending the use of these images for certain high ends she made use of infused faith which in her was super excellent and most efficacious in such manner one way or the other her soul never lost sight of that divine object nor wandered from it even for a moment 
however during the nine months in which she bore in her womb the incarnate word she enjoyed even greater visions and gifts of the divinity the second of these gifts is comprehension possession or apprehension this consists in the attainment of the end corresponding to the virtue of hope whereby we seek after the final object in order to possess it without danger of ever losing it this possession and comprehension in most holy mary corresponded to the visions mentioned because seeing the divinity she possessed it whenever she depended on faith alone hope was in her more firm and secure than in any other creature and more than this for as the security of possession in the creature is founded to a great extent upon sanctity and impeccability our heavenly lady on this account was so privileged that the firmness and security of her possession of god although she was a pilgrim equaled in certain respects the firmness and security of the blessed for on account of her stainless and unimpeachable sanctity she was assured of never losing god although the cause of this security in her as viatrix was not the same as in the glorified saints during the months of her pregnancy she enjoyed this possession of god in various ways by special and wonderful graces through which the most high manifested himself and united himself to her most pure soul the third gift is fruition which corresponds to charity since charity does not cease but is perfected in glory first letter to the corinthians chapter thirteen verse eight for fruition consists in loving the highest good possessed by us this is the charity of heaven that just as god is known and possessed as he is in himself so also he is loved for his own sake true even now while we are yet viators we love him for his own sake but there is a great difference now we love him in desire and we know him not as he is in himself but as he is represented to us by incongruous images or by enigmas first letter to the corinthians chapter thirteen verse twelve john chapter three verse two therefore our love is not perfected nor do we rest in it or find the plenitude of delight therein though there is much to incite us but in the clear vision and possession we shall see him as he is in himself and we shall see him through himself not through enigmas thus we shall love him as he should be loved and as far as we can love him respectively our love will be perfected and the fruition of him will be satiated without leaving anything to be desired most holy mary participated in this fruition more abundantly than in any other for even though her most ardent love might in a certain respect have been inferior to that of the blessed whenever she was without the clear vision of the divinity yet it was superior in many other points of excellence even while remaining in the lower state no one ever possessed the divine science in the same degree as this lady and by it she understood how god is to be loved for himself this science was perfected by the memory of what she had seen and enjoyed higher in degree than the angels and as her love was nourished by this knowledge of god it necessarily exceeded that of the blessed in all that it did not pertain to immediate fruition and unchangeableness as to increase or augmentation on account of her profound humility the lord condescended to an arrangement whereby she could act as a viatrix remaining in a holy fear of displeasing her beloved this burning love was of the most perfect kind and tended entirely toward god himself it caused in her ineffable joy and delight proportion to the excellence of her love in regard to the gifts of the body redounding from the gifts of glory and other gifts of the soul constituting the accidental part of the glory of the blessed i will say that they serve for the perfection of the glorious bodies in the activity of their senses and motive powers by them the bodies are assimilated to the soul and throw off the impediments of their earthly grossness enabling them to obey the wishes of the souls which in the most happy state cannot be imperfect or opposed to the will of god the senses require two gifts one to refine the reception of the sensible images and this is perfected by the gift of clearness the other to repel all activity or passivity hurtful and destructive of the body and this is done by the gift of impassibility two other gifts are required in order to perfect the power of motion 
one in order to overcome the resistance or impediment of gravity furnished by the gift of agility the other in order to overcome the resistance of other bodies furnished by the gift of subtlety with these gifts the body becomes glorious clear incorruptible agile and subtle in all these privileges our great queen and lady participated during her mortal life the gift of clearness disposes the body to receive the light and at the same time to give it forth doing away with earthly opaqueness and obscurity and making it more transparent than clearest crystal whenever most holy mary enjoyed the clear and beatific vision her virginal body participated in this privilege in a measure beyond all human calculation the after effects of this purity and clearness would have been most wonderful and astounding if they could have been made perceptible to the senses sometimes they were noticeable in her most beautiful face as i will say later on especially in the third part yet they were not known or perceived by all who conversed with her for the lord interposed a curtain or veil in order that they might not always or indiscriminately be manifested but in many respects she herself enjoyed the advantages of this gift though it was disguised suspended or hidden to the gaze of others she for instance was not inconvenienced by earthly opaqueness as the rest of men saint elizabeth perceived something of this clearness when at the sight of mary she exclaimed and whence is this to me that the mother of my lord should come to me luke chapter one verse forty three the world was not capable of perceiving this sacrament of the king tobias chapter twelve verse seven nor was it opportune to manifest it at that time yet to a certain extent her face was always more bright and lustrous than that of other creatures also in other respects it exhibited qualities altogether above the natural order of other bodies which produced in her a most delicate and spiritualized complexion like that of an animated crystal this presented to the touch not the asperity natural to the flesh but the softness as it were of the purest and the finest silk so that i cannot find any other comparison to make myself understood yet all this should not appear strange in the mother of god for she bore him in her womb and she had seen him often even face to face for the israelites could not look upon moses face to face nor bear the splendor which shone forth from him after his communication with the lord upon the mountain exodus chapter thirty four verse twenty nine though it was much inferior to that vouchsafed to most holy mary there is no doubt that if god had not by a special providence withheld and hidden the splendor in reality due to the countenance and the body of his most pure mother it would have brightened the world more than a thousand suns combined none of the mortals could by natural power have sustained its brilliancy since even thus restrained and concealed it was sufficient to cause in them the same effects which saint dionysius the areopagite experienced in looking upon her and which he describes in his letter to paul impassibility produces in the glorified body such a condition that no agent except god himself can by any activity or influence change or disturb it no matter how powerful this activity may be our queen participated in this gift in two ways first in regard to the temperament and humors of the body she possessed these in such a delicate measure and proportion that she could not contract or suffer any infirmities nor was she subject to any other human hardships which arise from the inequality of the four humors being in this regard as it were almost impassable secondly in regard to the dominion and commanding power which she had over all the creatures as mentioned above for none of them had power to act contrary to her will and consent we can add still another participation of impassibility the assistance of the divine power in proportion to her innocence for if it is said that the first parents in paradise could not suffer a violent death as long as they persevered in original justice it must not be understood to mean that they enjoyed this privilege by intrinsic or inherent powers for if a lance had wounded them they could die but they enjoyed it through the assistance of the lord who would always prevent them from being wounded if then the first parents possessed this privilege and could transmit it to their descendants as their servants and vassals 
it was due by a much better title to the innocence of the sovereign mary and so in truth she was endowed with it our most humble queen made no use of these privileges for she renounced them in imitation of her most holy son and in order to labor and gain merits for our benefit in spite of them she wished to suffer and she really suffered more than the martyrs human intellect cannot weigh correctly the greatness of these labors we shall speak of them throughout this heavenly history leaving much more untold for common language and words cannot encompass them but i must advert to two things first that the sufferings of our queen bore no relation to any sins of her own for she had none to atone for and therefore she suffered none of the bitterness which is mixed with pains endured in the memory and consciousness of our own guilt of sins committed secondly that in her sufferings she was divinely sustained in accordance with the ardors of her love for she could not naturally endure so much sufferings as her love called for or as much as on account of this very love the lord allowed her to endure subtlety is a gift which takes away from the glorified body the density or grossness natural to quantitative matter and which enables it to penetrate other bodies and to occupy the same place with them the subtilized bodies of the blessed therefore are endowed with qualities peculiar to the spirit and can without difficulty penetrate the quantitative matter of other bodies without dividing or separating them it can occupy the same place thus our lord's body coming forth from the grave matthew chapter twenty eight verse two and entering the closed doors john chapter twenty verse nineteen penetrated the material enclosing these places most holy mary participated in this gift not only while she enjoyed the beatific visions but also otherwise according to her will and desire as happened many times in her life in her bodily appearances to some persons of which we shall yet relate for in all these she made use of her gift of subtlety penetrating other bodies the last gift of the body enables the glorified body to move from place to place instantly and without the impediment of the terrene gravity in the manner of pure spirits which move by their own volition mary most holy possessed a continual and wonderful participation in this agility especially as a direct result of the divine visions she did not feel in her body the force of weight and gravity therefore she could walk without feeling the inconvenience usual to that kind of exercise she could move about with instantaneous speed without feeling any shock or fatigue as we would feel all this belonged naturally to the quality and condition of her body so spiritualized and well formed during the time of her pregnancy she felt even less the weight of her body although in order to bear her share of labors she allowed hardships to produce their effect she was so admirable and perfect in the possession and use of these privileges that i find myself wanting in words to express all that has been made manifest to me concerning them for it exceeds all i have said or am able to say queen of heaven and my mistress since thou hast condescended to adopt me as thy daughter thy word will remain a pledge that thou wilt be my guide and teacher relying on this promise i presume to propose a difficulty in which i find myself how does it come my mother and lady that thy most blessed soul after it had enjoyed the clear intuition of god according to the disposition of his majesty did not remain in the state of blessedness and why can we not say that thou didst remain in this state of beatitude since there was no sin or any other obstacle to this state in thee according to the dignity and sanctity revealed to me by the supernatural light answer and explanation of our queen and lady my dearest daughter thou doubtest as one that loves me and askest as one not knowing consider then that the perpetuity and durability of blessedness and felicity is destined for the saints since their happiness is to be entirely perfect if it would last only for some time it would be wanting in the completeness and adequacy necessary for constituting it as the highest and most perfect happiness at the same time it is incompatible with the common law and ordinary course that the creature be glorified and at the same time be subject to sufferings even though it be without sin 
if this law did not hold good with my most holy son john chapter 1 verse 18 it was because he was at the same time god and man and it was not befitting that his most holy soul being hypostatically united with the divinity should be without the beatific vision and as he was at the same time redeemer of the human race he could not suffer nor pay the debt of sin that is pain if he had not possessed a body capable of suffering but i was a mere creature and therefore i could have no claim to the vision which to him was due as a god moreover i could not be said to have permanently enjoyed the state of blessedness because it was conceded to me from one time to another under these conditions i was capable of suffering at one time and enjoying blessedness at another moreover it was more usual for me to suffer and to gain merits than to be blessed since i belong to the viators and not to the comprehensors justly the most high has ordained that the blessedness of external life should not be enjoyed in this mortal existence exodus chapter thirty three verse twenty and that immortality should be reached by passing through existence in a mortal body and by gaining merits in a state of suffering such as is the present life of men romans chapter six verse twenty three although death in all the sins of adam was the stipend and punishment of sin romans chapter six verse twenty three and therefore death and all the other effects and chastisements had no rights in me who had not sinned yet the most high ordained that i also in imitation of my most holy son should enter into felicity and eternal life by the death of the body luke chapter twenty four verse twenty six there was nothing incongruous in this for me but it afforded me many advantages allowing me to follow the royal way of all men and gain many merits and great glory by suffering and dying another advantage resulted therefrom for men for they saw that my most holy son and i myself who was his mother were truly human as they themselves since we proved to them our mortality thereby the example which we left them became much more efficacious and they would be induced to imitate the life which we led and which redounded so much to the greater glory and exaltation of my son and lord and of myself all this would have come to naught if the visions of the divinity had been continuous in me however after i conceived the eternal word the benefits and favors were more frequent and greater since i was then brought into close connection with him this is my answer to thy questions no matter how much thou hast meditated and labored in manifesting the privileges and their effects enjoyed by me in mortal life thou wilt never be able to comprehend all that the powerful arm of the omnipotent wrought in me and much less canst thou describe in human words what thou hast understood now attend to the instruction which i will give thee regarding the preceding chapters if i was the model to be imitated in the way i responded to the coming of god into the soul and into the world by showing due reverence worship humility and thankful love it follows that if thou and in the same way the rest of the souls art solicitous in imitating me the most high will come and produce the same effects in thee as in myself though they may not be so great and efficacious for if the creature as soon as it obtains the use of reason begins to advance toward the lord as it should directing its steps in the path of life and salvation his most high majesty will issue forth to meet it wisdom chapter six verse fifteen being beforehand with his favors and communications for to him it seems a long time to wait for the end of the pilgrimage in order to manifest himself to his friends thus it happens that by means of faith hope and charity and by the worthy reception of the sacraments many divine effects wrought by his condescension are communicated to the souls some are communicated according to the ordinary course of grace and others according to a more supernatural and wonderful order and each one will be more or less conformable to the disposition of the soul and to the ends intended by the lord which are not known at present and if the souls do not place any obstacle on their part he will be just as liberal with them as with those who dispose themselves 
giving them greater light and knowledge of his immutable being and by a divine and exceedingly sweet infusion of grace transforming them into a likeness of himself and communicating to them many of the privileges of the beatified for after he is found he allows himself to be taken possession of and enjoyed by that hidden embrace which the spouse felt when she said i will hold him and not dismiss him canticles chapter three verse four of this possession and of his presence the lord himself will give many tokens and pledges in order that the soul may possess him in peace like the blessed although always only for a limited time so liberal as this will god our master and lord be in rewarding the objects of his love for the labors accepted by them for his sake and fearlessly undertaken to gain possession of him in this sweet violence of love the creatures begin to withdraw from and die to all earthly things and that is why love is called strong as death from this death arises a new spiritual life which makes the soul capable of receiving new participations of the blessed and their gifts for it enjoys more frequently the overshadowing of the most high and the fruits of the highest good which it loves these mysterious influences cause a sort of overflow into the interior and animal parts of the creature producing a certain transparency and purifying it from the effects of the spiritual darknesses it makes it courageous and as it were indifferent to suffering ready to meet and endure all that is adverse to the inclinations of the flesh with a certain subtle thirst it begins to seek after the difficulty and violence incident to the attainment of the kingdom of heaven matthew chapter eleven verse twelve it becomes alert and unhindered by earthly grossness so that many times the body itself begins to feel this lightness in regard to its own self the labors which before seemed burdensome become easy of all these effects thou hast knowledge and experience my daughter and i have described and rehearsed them for thee in order that thou mayest dispose thyself and labor so much the more earnestly so that the divine activity and power of the most high in working out his pleasure in thee may find thee well disposed and free from resistance and hindrance End of chapter 13book one chapter fourteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter fourteen of the attention and care which the most holy mary bestowed upon the fruit of her womb and some happenings in regard to it as soon as our lady and queen issued from the trance in which she had conceived the eternal incarnate word she prostrated herself upon the earth and adored him in her womb as i have already said in the twelfth chapter this adoration she continued all her life commencing it at midnight every day and repeating these genuflections three hundred times until the same hour of the following night and oftener whenever she had the opportunity in this she was even more diligent during the nine months of her divine pregnancy in order to comply entirely with the new duties consequent upon the guarding of this treasure of the eternal father in the virginal bridal chamber she directed all her attention toward frequent and fervent prayer she was solicitous in sending up many and reiterated petitions to be able worthily to preserve the heavenly treasure confided to her accordingly she dedicated anew to the lord her soul and all her faculties practicing all virtues in a heroic and supreme degree so that she caused new astonishment in the angels she also consecrated and offered up all the motions of her body to the worship and service of the infant god man within her whether she ate slept labored or rested she did it all for the nourishment and conservation of her sweetest son and in all these actions she was inflamed more and more with divine love on the day following the incarnation the thousand guardian angels which attended upon most holy mary appeared in corporeal form and with profound humility adored their incarnate king in the womb of the mother her also they acknowledged anew as their queen and mistress and rendered her due homage and reverence saying now o lady thou art the true ark of the testament 
Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 5. Since thou containest the lawgiver himself, and preservest the manna of heaven, which is our true bread, receive, O queen, our congratulations on account of thy dignity and happiness, for which we also thank the Most High, since he has befittingly chosen thee for his mother and his tabernacle. We offer anew to thee our homage and service, and wish to obey thee as vassals and servants of the supreme and omnipotent king, whose mother thou art. These protestations and homages of the holy angels excited in the mother of wisdom incomparable sentiments of humility, gratitude, and love of God. For in this most prudent heart, where all things were weighed with the scales of the sanctuary according to their true value and weight, this reverence and acknowledgment of the angelic spirits proclaiming her as their queen, was held in high esteem. Although it was a greater thing to see herself the mother of the king and lord of all creation, yet all her blessings and dignities were made more evident by these demonstrations and homages of the holy angels. The angels rendered this homage as executors and ministers of the will of the Most High. When their queen and our lady was alone, all of them attended upon her in corporeal form, and they assisted her in her outward actions and occupations. And when she was engaged in manual labor, they administered to her what was needed. Whenever she happened to eat alone in the absence of St. Joseph, they waited upon her at her poor table and at her humble meals. Everywhere they followed her and formed an escort, and helped her in the services rendered to St. Joseph. Amid all these favors and obsequious attendance, the heavenly lady did not forget to ask permission from the master of masters for all her operations and undertakings and to implore his direction and assistance. So exact and so well governed were all her exercises according to the plenitude of perfection that the Lord alone could comprehend and properly weigh them. Besides the ordinary guidance during the time in which she carried in her most holy womb the incarnate word, she felt his divine presence in diverse ways, all admirable and most sweet. Sometimes he showed himself to her by abstractive vision, as mentioned above. At other times she saw and beheld him as he was now present in the virginal temple, united hypostatically with the human nature. At other times, the most holy humanity was manifested to her, as if in a chrysaline monstrance, composed of her own maternal womb and purest body. This kind of vision afforded special consolation and delight to the great queen. At other times, she perceived how the glory of his most holy soul overflowed into the body of the divine child, communicating to it some of the effects of its own blessedness and glory, and how the clarity and light of the natural body of her son passed over in a wonderfully sweet, ineffable, and divine manner into herself as the mother. This favor transformed her entirely into another kind of being, inflaming her heart and causing in her such effects as no created capacity can describe. Let the intellect of the highest seraphim extend and dilate as much as it may, it would nevertheless find itself overwhelmed by this glory. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 27 for the entire being of the heavenly queen was an intellectual and animated heaven, and in her was summarized the divine glory and greatness, in a measure that even the vast confines of the heavens themselves could not encompass. These and other prerogatives alternated and succeeded each other, in accordance with the exercises of the divine mother, and such variety as suited the different kinds of work which she performed. All her doings, whether spiritual or manual or otherwise of the body, served her God or benefited her neighbors, being undertaken and accomplished by this prudent maiden to produce a harmony admirable and most sweet before the Lord and wonderful to the angelic spirits. And when by the disposition of the Most High, the mistress of the world returned to a more natural state, she suffered mortal agony caused by the force and violence of her love, for to her could, in truth, be applied what Solomon says in the name of the spouse. Stay with me with flowers, compass me about with apples. Canticles chapter 2 verse 5 And thus it would happen, that by the piercing wounds of these sweet arrows of love, she was brought near to the ending of her life. But in this necessity, the powerful arm of the Most High was wont to strengthen her in a supernatural manner. Sometimes, in order to afford her sensible relief, 
innumerable birds would come to visit her by the command of the Lord. As if they were endowed with intellect, they would salute her by their lively movements, and dividing into harmonious choirs, would furnish her with sweetest music, and they would wait for her blessing before again dispersing. This happened in a special manner, soon after she had conceived the divine word, as if they wished to congratulate her on her dignity in imitation of the angels. The mistress of all creatures on that day spoke to the different kinds of birds, and commanded them to remain and praise with her the Creator, in thanksgiving for the creation, and for the existence and beauty given to them, and to sing his praises for their conservation. Immediately they obeyed her as their mistress, and anew they began to form choirs, singing in sweetest harmony and bowed low to the ground to worship their Creator, and honor the mother who bore him in her womb. They were accustomed to bring flowers to her in their beaks, and place them into her hands, waiting until she should command them to sing or to be silent, according to her wishes. It also happened that in bad weather, some birds would come and seek the protection of the heavenly lady, and she took them in and nourished them, in her admirable innocence, glorifying the creator of all things. And our weak ignorance must not be estranged at these wonders, for though the incidents may be called small, the purposes of the Most High are great and venerable in all his works, and also the works of our most prudent queen were great, no matter of what kind they might have been. And who is so presumptuous as to ignore the importance of knowing how much of God's essence and perfections are manifest in the existence of all the creatures? How important is it to seek him and find him, to bless him and magnify him in all his creatures, as admirable, powerful, generous, and holy? Why should it not be our duty to imitate Mary, who overlooked no time, place, or occasion, to attain this object? And how shall our ungrateful forgetfulness not be confounded, and our hardness of heart not be softened? How can our listless heart fail to be aroused, when we see ourselves reprehended and urged for very shame to thankfulness by the irrational creatures, Merely for the slight participation of the divinity that consists in bare existence, they proclaim his praises without intermission, whereas we men, who are made to the image and likeness of God, furnished with the powers of knowing him and enjoying him eternally, forget him so far as not even to know him, and instead of serving him, offend him. Thus it comes that in no wise can man be preferred to the brute animals, since they have become worse than the brutes psalm 48 verse 13 instruction given by our most holy queen and lady my daughter thou hast received my instruction until now in order to desire and strive after the heavenly science which i wish thee so earnestly to acquire and which shall teach thee to understand profoundly what decorous reverence is due to god i remind thee once more that this science is very hard to learn, and little coveted by men, on account of their ignorance. For thence, to their great loss, it arises that, in conversing with the Most High or rendering Him service or worship, they fail to form a worthy concept of His infinite greatness, and to free themselves from the darksome images of their earthly occupations, which make them torpid and carnal, unworthy and unfit for the magnificent intercourse with the supernal deity. And this ill-bred coarseness entails another disorder, namely, that whenever they converse with their neighbors, they do it without order, measure, or discretion, become entangled in their outward actions, and losing the memory and presence of their Creator, in the excitement of their passions, are completely entangled in what is earthly. I desire, therefore, my dearest, that thou fly from this danger, and learn the science of the immutable being and infinite attributes of God. In such a way thou must study him, and unite thyself to him, that no created being will come between thy soul and the true and highest good. At all times, and in all places, occupations and operations, thou must keep him in sight, without releasing him from the intimate embrace of thy heart. Canticles chapter 3 verse 4 Therefore I command thee to treat him with a magnanimous heart, with decorum and reverence, with deep felt fear of the soul, and whatever pertains to his divine worship, I desire that thou handle with all attention and care. Above all, in order to enter into his presence, by prayer and petitions, 
free thyself from all sensible and earthly images and since human frailty cannot always remain constant in the force of love nor always experience the sweet violence of its movements on account of its earthly nature thou shouldst seek other assistance such as will help thee toward the same end of finding thy god such help for instance is afforded by his praise in the beauty of the heavens and of the stars in the variety of the plants in the pleasant vista of the fields in the forces of the elements and especially in the exalted nature of the angels and in the glory of his saints but bear continually in mind especially this particular caution not to seek any earthly alleviation in any event or in any labor which thou art to undergo nor to indulge in any diversion coming from human creatures and especially not in those coming from men for an account of thy naturally weak and yielding character so much adverse to giving pain thou placest thyself in danger of exceeding and overstepping the limit of what is allowed or just following more than is proper for the religious spouses of my most holy son thy sensible likings the risks of this negligence of all the human creatures incur for if full reins are given to frail human nature it will not give heed to reason nor to the true light of the spirit but forgetting them entirely it will blindly follow the impulse of its passions and pleasures against this general danger is provided the enclosure and retirement of the souls consecrated to my son and lord in order to cut off the root of those unhappy and disgraceful occasions for those religious who would willingly seek them and entangle themselves in them thy recreations my dearest and those of thy sister religious must be free from such dangers and deadly poison seek always those which thou shalt find in the secret of thy breast and in the chamber of thy beloved who is faithful in consoling the sorrowful and in assisting the afflicted end of chapter fourteen book one chapter fifteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter fifteen most holy mary is informed of the will of the lord that she visit holy elizabeth she asked saint joseph for permission to go remaining silent about all that had happened to her by the words of the heavenly messenger the archangel gabriel most holy mary had been informed that her cousin elizabeth who was held to be sterile had conceived a son and that she was already in the sixth month of her pregnancy afterwards in one of the intellectual visions the most high revealed to her that in a miraculous birth elizabeth would bring forth a son who would be great before the lord luke chapter one verse fifteen a prophet and the forerunner of the incarnate word also other great mysteries of the holiness and of the personality of saint john were revealed to her on this same occasion and on others the heavenly queen was informed that it would be agreeable and pleasing to the lord if she would visit her cousin in order that as well elizabeth as also the child in her womb might be sanctified by the presence of their redeemer for his majesty was anxious to communicate the benefits of his coming into the world and his merits to his precursor in order to make of him as it were the well-seasoned first fruit of his redemption at the news of this sacramental mystery the most prudent virgin with admirable jubilee of spirit rendered thanks to the lord for such great condescension and favor vouchsafed to the soul of the precursor and prophet and to his mother elizabeth signifying her readiness to fulfil the divine pleasure she spoke to his majesty and said most high lord beginning and cause of all good let thy name be eternally glorified acknowledged and praised by all the nations i the least of thy creatures give thee humble thanks for the liberal kindness which thou wishest to show to thy servant elizabeth and to the son of her womb if it is according to the promptings of thy condescension that i serve thee in this work i stand prepared my lord to obey eagerly thy divine mandates the most high answered her my dove and my beloved elect among creatures truly i say to thee on account of thy intercession and thy love i will as a father and most liberal god take care of thy cousin elizabeth and of the son who is to be born of her 
I will choose him as my prophet, and as the precursor of the word, which is made man in thee. I will look upon them as belonging to thee, and intimately connected with thyself. Therefore I wish, that my and thy only begotten, go to see the mother, in order to free the son from the chains of the first sin, and in order that, before the common and ordinary time, decreed for other men, his voice and praise may sound up to my ears. Canticles chapter 2 verse 14 And that the mysteries of the incarnation and redemption may be revealed to his sanctified soul. Therefore I wish thee to visit Elizabeth, for we three persons of the blessed Trinity have chosen her son for great deeds conformable to our pleasure. To this command of the Lord, the most obedient mother responded, Thou knowest, my Lord and God, that all the desires of my heart seek but thy divine pleasure, and that I wish to fulfill diligently whatever thou commandest of thy humble servant. Allow me, my God, to ask permission from my husband Joseph, and that I make this journey according to his will and direction. And in order that I may not divulge from what is thy pleasure, do thou govern me during that journey in all my actions. Direct my footsteps to the greater glory of thy name. Psalm 118, verse 13. Accept, therefore, the sacrifice which I bring in going out in public and in leaving my cherished retirement. I wish to offer more than my desires, God and King of my soul. I hope to be made able to suffer all that will conduce to thy greater service and pleasure purely for thy love, so that the longings of my soul may not remain entirely unfulfilled. When our great queen came out of this vision, she called upon the thousand angels of her guard, who appeared to her in bodily forms, and told them of the command of the Most High. She asked them to assist her with careful solicitude in this journey, to teach her how to fulfill all the commands, according to the greater pleasure of the Lord, to defend her and guard her from dangers, so that she might conduct herself in all things during that journey, in the most perfect manner. The holy princes, with wonderful devotion, offered to obey and serve her. In the same manner, the mistress of all prudence and humility was wont to act also on other occasions. For though she was herself more wise and more perfect in her deeds than the angels, yet because she was yet in the state of pilgrimage, and endowed with a nature lower than that of the angels, she was always solicitous to attain the plenitude of perfection, by consulting and asking for the aid of her guardian angels, though they were her inferiors in sanctity. Under their direction, as also by the promptings of the Holy Spirit, all her human actions were well disposed and well ordered. The heavenly spirits obeyed her with alacrity and punctuality, such as was proper to their nature and due to their queen and lady. They held sweet intercourse and delightful colloquy with her, and alternately with her, they sang highest songs of praise and adoration of the Most High. At other times, they conversed about the supernal mysteries of the incarnate word, the hypostatic union, the sacrament of the redemption, the triumphs to be celebrated by him, the fruits and blessings accruing therefrom to mortals. It would necessitate lengthening out this work too much, if I were to write all that has been revealed to me about these conversations. The humble spouse proceeded immediately to ask the consent of St. Joseph for executing the mandate of the Most High, and, in her consummate prudence, she said nothing of these happenings, but simply spoke to him these words. My Lord and spouse, by the divine light it was made known to me, that through condescension of the Most High, the prayer of my cousin Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, has been heard. She has conceived a son, though she was sterile. Since she has obtained this singular blessing, I hope that through God's infinite bounty, her son will greatly please and glorify the Lord. I think that on this occasion, I am under obligation to visit her and converse with her on certain things for her consolation and spiritual encouragement. If this is according to thy liking, my master, I will perform it with thy permission, for I am entirely subject to thy will and pleasure. Consider then what is best for me and command what I am to do. This prudent silence of the Most Holy Mary, so full of humble subjection, was very agreeable to the Lord, for she showed herself thereby worthy and capable of receiving the deposit of the great sacraments of the King. Tobias, chapter 12, verse 7. Therefore, and on account of the confidence in his fidelity with which she proceeded, 
his majesty disposed the most pure heart of saint joseph giving him his divine light to act conformably to his will this is the reward of the humble who ask for counsel that they will find it with certainty and security ecclesiasticus chapter thirty two verse twenty nine it is also the particular prerogative of a holy and discreet zeal to be able to give prudent advice to those that ask full of this holy counsel saint joseph answered our queen thou knowest already my lady and spouse that my utmost desires are to serve thee with all diligence and attention for i am bound to have this confidence in thy great virtue that thou wilt not incline toward anything which is not according to the greater pleasure and glory of the most high and this is my belief also in regard to this journey lest thy making this journey alone and without the company of thy husband cause surprise i will gladly go with thee and attend to thy wants on the way do thou appoint the day on which we shall depart together the most holy mary thanked her prudent spouse joseph for his loving solicitude and for his attentive cooperation with the will of god in whatever he knew to be his service and honor they both concluded to depart immediately on their visit to the house of saint elizabeth luke chapter one verse thirty nine and prepared without delay the provisions which consisted merely of a little fruit bread and a few fishes procured by saint joseph in addition to these he borrowed a humble beast of burden in order to carry their provisions and his spouse the queen of all creation forthwith they departed from nazareth for judea the journey itself i will describe in the following chapter on leaving their poor dwelling the great mistress of the world knelt at the feet of her spouse joseph and asked his blessing in order to begin the journey in the name of the lord the saint was abashed at the rare humility of his spouse with which he had already been impressed by experience on so many other occasions he hesitated giving her his benediction but the meek and sweet persistence of the most holy mary overcame his objections and he blessed her in the name of the most high the heavenly lady raised her eyes and her heart to god in order to direct her first steps toward the fulfillment of the divine pleasure and willingly bear along in her womb the only begotten of the father and her own for the sanctification of john in that of his mother elizabeth instruction which the heavenly queen and lady gave me my dearest daughter many times i have confided and manifested to thee the love burning within my bosom for i wish that it should be ardently re-enkindled within thy own and that thou profit from the instruction which i give thee happy is the soul to which the most high manifests his holy and perfect will but more happy and blessed is he who puts into execution what he has learned in many ways god shows to mortals the highways and byways of eternal life by the gospels and the holy scriptures by the sacraments and the laws of the holy church by the writings and examples of the saints and especially by the obedience due to the guidings of its ministers of whom his majesty said whoever hears you hears me for obeying them is the same as obeying the lord himself whenever by any of these means thou hast come to the knowledge of the will of god i desire thee to assume the wings of humility and obedience and as if in ethereal flight or like the quickest sunbeam hasten to execute it and thereby fulfill the divine pleasure besides these means of instruction the most high has still others in order to direct the soul namely he intimates his perfect will to them in a supernatural manner and reveals to them many sacraments this kind of instruction is of many and different degrees not all of them are common or ordinary to all souls for the lord dispenses his light in measure and weight wisdom chapter eleven verse twenty one sometimes he speaks to the heart and the interior feelings in commands at others in correction advising or instructing sometimes he moves the heart to ask him at other times he proposes clearly what he desires in order that the soul may be moved to fulfill it again he manifests as in a clear mirror great mysteries in order that they may be seen and recognized by the intellect and loved by the will but this great and infinite good is always sweet and commanding powerful in giving the necessary help for obedience just in his commands quick in disposing circumstances so that he can be obeyed notwithstanding all the impediments which hinder the fulfillment of his most holy will 
in receiving this divine light my daughter i wish to see thee very attentive and very quick and diligent in following up indeed in order to hear this most delicate and spiritual voice of the lord it is necessary that the faculties of the soul be purged from earthly grossness and that the creature live entirely according to the spirit for the animal man does not perceive the elevated things of the divinity first letter to the corinthians chapter two verse fourteen be attentive then to his secrets isaiah chapter twenty four verse sixteen and forget all that is of the outside listen my daughter and incline thy ear free thyself from visible things psalm forty four verse eleven and in order that thou mayest be diligent cultivate love for love is a fire which does not have its effects until the material is prepared therefore let thy heart always be disposed and prepared whenever the most high bids thee or communicates to thee anything for the welfare of souls or especially for their eternal salvation devote thyself to it entirely for they are bought at the inestimable price of the blood of the lamb and of divine love do not allow thyself to be hindered in this matter by thy own lowliness and bashfulness but overcome the fear which restrains thee for if thou thyself art of small value and usefulness the most high is rich first letter of peter chapter one verse eighteen powerful great and by himself performs all things romans chapter ten verse twelve thy promptness and affection will not go without its reward although i wish thee rather to be moved entirely by the pleasure of thy lord end of chapter fifteen book one chapter sixteen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter sixteen the journey of the most holy mary on her visit to saint elizabeth and her entrance into the house of zacharias and mary rising up in those days says the sacred text went into the hill country with haste into a city of judea luke chapter one verse thirty nine this rising up of our heavenly queen signified not only her exterior preparations and setting out from nazareth on her journey but it referred to the movement of her spirit and to the divine impulse and command which directed her to arise interiorly from the humble retirement which she had chosen in her humility she arose as it were from the feet of the most high whose will and pleasure she eagerly sought to fulfil like the lowliest handmaiden who according to the word of david psalm one hundred twenty two verse two keeps her eyes fixed upon the hands of her mistress awaiting her commands arising at the bidding of the lord she lovingly hastened to accomplish his most holy will in procuring without delay the sanctification of the precursor of the incarnate word who was yet held prisoner in the womb of elizabeth by the bonds of original sin this was the purpose and object of this journey therefore the princess of heaven arose and proceeded in diligent haste as mentioned by the evangelist saint luke leaving behind then the house of her father and forgetting her people psalm forty four verse eleven the most chaste spouses mary and joseph pursued their way to the house of zacharias in mountainous judea it was twenty-six leagues distant from nazareth and the greater part of the way was very rough and broken unfit for such a delicate and tender maiden all the convenience at their disposal for the arduous undertaking was a humble beast on which she began and pursued her journey although it was intended solely for her comfort and service yet mary the most humble and unpretentious of all creatures many times dismounted and asked her spouse saint joseph to share with her this commodity and to lighten the difficulties of the way by making use of the beast her discreet spouse never accepted this offer and in order to yield somewhat to the solicitations of the heavenly lady he permitted her now and then to walk with him part of the way whenever it seemed to him that her delicate strength could sustain the exertion without too great fatigue but soon he would again ask her with great modesty and reverence to accept of this slight alleviation 
and the celestial queen would then obey and again proceed on her way seated in the saddle thus alleviating their fatigue by humble and courteous contentions the most holy mary and saint joseph continued on their journey making good use of every single moment they proceeded alone without accompaniment of any human creatures but all the thousand angels which were set to guard the couch of solomon the most holy mary attended upon them canticles chapter three verse seven although the angels accompanied them in corporeal form serving their great queen and her most holy son in her womb they were visible only to mary in the company of the angels and of saint joseph the mother of grace journeyed along filling the fields and the mountains with the sweetest fragrance of her presence and with the divine praises in which she unceasingly occupied herself sometimes she conversed with the angels and alternating with them sang divine canticles concerning the different mysteries of the divinity and the works of creation and of the incarnation thus ever anew the pure heart of the immaculate lady was inflamed by the ardors of divine love in all this her spouse saint joseph contributed his share by maintaining a discreet silence and by allowing his beloved spouse to pursue the flights of her spirit for lost in highest contemplation he was favored with some understanding of what was passing within her soul at other times the two would converse with each other and speak about the salvation of souls and the mercies of the lord of the coming of the redeemer of the prophecies given to the ancient fathers concerning him and of other mysteries and sacraments of the most high something happened on the way which caused great wonder in her holy spouse joseph he loved his spouse most tenderly with a chaste and holy love such as had been ordained in him by the special grace and dispensation of the divine love itself canticles chapter two verse four in addition to this privilege which was certainly not a small one the saint was naturally of a most noble and courteous disposition and his manners were most pleasing and charming all this produced in him a most discreet and loving solicitude which was yet increased by the great holiness which he had seen from the beginning in his spouse and which was ordained by heaven as the immediate object of all his privileges therefore the saint anxiously attended upon most holy mary and asked her many times whether she was tired or fatigued and in what he could serve her on the journey but as the queen of heaven already carried within the virginal chamber the divine fire of the incarnate word holy joseph without fathoming the real cause experienced in his soul new reactions proceeding from the words and conversations of his beloved spouse he felt himself so inflamed by divine love and imbued with such exalted knowledge of the mysteries touched upon in their conversations he was entirely renewed and spiritualized by this burning interior light the farther they proceeded and the more they conversed about these heavenly things so much the stronger these affections grew and he became aware that it was the words of his spouse which thus filled his heart with love and inflamed his will with divine ardor so great were these new sensations that the prudent joseph could not help but pay the greatest attention to them although he knew that all this came to him through the mediation of most holy mary and although it was a wonderful consolation to him that she was the cause he meditated upon it without curiosity and on account of his great modesty he did not dare to ask her any questions the lord having ordained it thus for it was not yet time that he should know the sacrament of the king which was already completed in her virginal womb the heavenly princess beheld the interior of her spouse knowing all that passed within his soul and in her prudence she reflected how it would naturally be unavoidable that he should come to know of her pregnancy for there would be no possibility of concealing it from her most beloved and chaste spouse the great lady did not know at the time how god would arrange this matter yet although she had not received any intimation or command to conceal this mystery her heavenly prudence and discretion taught her that it would be proper to conceal it as a great sacrament greater than all other mysteries therefore she kept it secret saying not a word about it to her husband neither after the message of the angel nor during this journey nor later on during the anxieties occasioned to saint joseph at becoming aware of her pregnancy o oh, admirable discretion and prudence more than human the great queen resigned herself entirely to the divine providence hoping that god would arrange all things 
yet she felt anxiety and pain at the thought of what her husband might think and of her inability to do anything in order to dissipate his anxiety this anxiety was increased by the attentive care and service lavished by him upon her with so much love and affection since his faithful services certainly deserved a corresponding return on her part as far as was prudently possible therefore in loving solicitude and in pursuance of her desires to solve this coming difficulty she prayed to the lord asking him to grant his divine assistance and guidance to saint joseph when it should arrive in this state of suspense in which she found herself her highness performed great and heroic acts of faith hope and charity of prudence humility patience and fortitude imbuing all her activity with the plenitude of holiness and reaching in all things the summit of perfection this journey was the first pilgrimage begun by the divine word four days after he had entered the world for his most ardent love would not suffer any longer delay or procrastination in enkindling the fire which he came to scatter in the world luke chapter twelve verse forty nine and in beginning his justification of mortals with his precursor this haste he communicated also to his holy mother in order that she might arise without delay and fly on her visit to elizabeth luke chapter one verse thirty nine the most heavenly lady on this occasion served as the coach of the true solomon but much more richly adorned and more elegant as solomon himself infers in the canticles canticles chapter three verse nine therefore this journey was glorious and occasioned great joy to the only begotten of the father for he travelled at his ease in the virginal chamber of his mother enjoying the sweet tokens of her love at the time she alone was the archive of this treasure the secretary of so great a sacrament and she adored him blessed and affirmed him spoke and listened to him and answered him she reverenced him and thanked him for herself and for all the human race much more than all the men and the angels together in the course of the journey which lasted four days the two holy pilgrims mary and joseph exercised not only the virtues which were interior and had god for their immediate object but also many other outward acts of charity toward their neighbors for mary could not remain idle at the sight of want they did not find the same hospitable treatment at all the inns of the road for some of the innkeepers being more rude treated them with slight consideration in accordance with their natural disposition others received them with true love inspired by divine grace but the mother of mercy denied to no one such help as she could administer and therefore whenever she could decently do so she hastened to visit and hunt up the poor infirm and afflicted helping them and consoling them and curing their sicknesses i will not stop to relate all that happened on the way but will only mention the good fortune of a poor sick girl whom our great queen found in passing through a town on the first day of her journey she was moved to tenderest compassion at the sight of her grievous illness and making use of her power as mistress of the creatures she commanded the fever to leave the maiden and the humours to recompose and reduce themselves to their natural state and condition at this command and at the sweet presence of the purest mother the sick maiden was suddenly freed and healed from her pains of body and benefited in soul so that afterwards she lived more and more perfectly and attained the state of sanctity for the image of the authoress of her happiness remained stamped within her memory and her heart was enkindled with a great love toward the heavenly lady although she never saw her again nor was the miracle ever made public having pursued their journey four days the most holy mary and her spouse arrived at the town of judah where zachary and elizabeth then lived this was the special and proper name of the place where the parents of st john lived for a while and therefore the evangelist st luke specifies it calling it judah although the commentators have commonly believed that this was not the name of the town in which elizabeth and zacharias lived but simply the name of the province which was called judah or judea just as for the same reason the mountains south of jerusalem were called the mountains of judea but it was expressly revealed to me that the town was called judah and that the evangelist calls it by its proper name although the learned expositors have understood by this name of judah the province in which that town was situated this confusion arose from the fact that some years after the death of christ 
the town judah was destroyed and as the commentators found no trace of such a town they inferred that saint luke meant the province and not the town thus the great differences of opinion in regard to the place where most holy mary visited elizabeth are easily explained as holy obedience was enjoined upon me the duty of clearing up these doubts on account of the strange inconsistency in the sayings of learned men i will also add to what i have already said that the house in which the visitation took place was built upon the very spot on which now the faithful pilgrims who travel to or live in the holy land venerate the divine mysteries transacted during the visit although the town of judah itself where the house of zacharias stood is ruined the lord did not permit the memory of the venerable locality in which those great mysteries transpired and which were hallowed by the footsteps of most holy mary of christ our lord and of the baptist as well as his holy parents to be blotted out and effaced from the memory of men therefore it was by divine influence that the ancient christians built up those churches and restored the holy places in order to preserve by the agency of divine light the traditional truth and to renew the memory of the admirable sacraments thus we ourselves the faithful of our times can enjoy the blessing of venerating and worshipping the sacred localities proclaiming and confessing our catholic faith in the works of our redemption for the better understanding of these things let it be remembered that after the demon had become aware on calvary that christ our lord was god and the redeemer of men he sought with incredible fury to blot out the remembrance of him from the land of the living as jeremiah says jeremiah chapter eleven verse nineteen and the same is to be said of the memory of his most holy mother thus he managed to have the most holy cross hidden and buried underground and to have it delivered as spoil of war to the persians and in the same way he procured the ruin and obliteration of many holy places on this account the holy angels carried back and forth so many times the venerable and holy house of loretto for the same dragon who pursued the heavenly lady apocalypse chapter twelve verse thirteen had already excited the minds of the inhabitants of that land to tear down and raise to the ground that most sacred oratory which had been the workshop of the most high in the mystery of the incarnation the same astute hatred of the enemy urged him to blot out the town of judah aided partly by the negligence of the inhabitants who gradually died off partly also by untoward events and happenings yet the lord did not allow all traces of the house of zachary to be effaced or obliterated on account of the sacraments which were then enacted this town was distant from nazareth as i have said twenty-six leagues and about two leagues from jerusalem and it was situated in that part of the judean mountains where the stream sorek takes its rise after the birth of st john and the return of the most holy mary and her spouse joseph to nazareth st elizabeth received a divine revelation that a great calamity and slaughter impended over the infants of bethlehem and its vicinity and though this revelation was indeterminate and unclear it nevertheless induced the mother of st john to betake herself with zacharias her husband to hebron which was eight leagues more or less from jerusalem for they were rich and noble and they had dwellings not only in judah and hebron but they had houses and possessions also in other places when the most holy mary and joseph were on their way flying from herod to egypt matthew chapter two verse fourteen after the birth of the word and some months after the birth of st john st elizabeth and zacharias were in hebron zacharias died four months after our lord was born which was ten months after the birth of his son john it seems to me i have now sufficiently solved this doubt and it ought to be evident that the house of the visitation was neither in jerusalem nor in bethlehem nor in hebron but in the town called judah i saw that this is the true explanation which was made known to me by divine light together with the other mysteries of this heavenly history afterwards when i was constrained by obedience to ask about this matter a holy angel again made the same declaration to me it was at this city of judah and at the house of zacharias that most holy mary and joseph arrived in order to announce their visit saint joseph hastened ahead of mary and calling out saluted the inmates of the house saying 
the lord be with you and fill your souls with divine grace elizabeth was already forewarned for the lord himself had informed her in a vision that mary of nazareth had departed to visit her she had also in this vision been made aware that the heavenly lady was most pleasing in the eyes of the most high while the mystery of her being the mother of god was not revealed to her until the moment when they both saluted each other in private but saint elizabeth immediately issued forth with a few of her family in order to welcome most holy mary who as the more humble and younger in years hastened to salute her cousin saying the lord be with you my dearest cousin and elizabeth answered the same lord reward you for having come in order to afford me this pleasure with these words they entered the house of zacharias and what happened i will relate in the following chapter instruction which our queen and lady gave me my daughter whenever the creature holds in proper esteem the good works and the services which the lord commands for his glory it will feel within itself great facility of operation great sweetness in undertaking them and a readiness and alacrity in continuing and pursuing them these different feelings then give testimony of their being truly useful and commanded by god but the soul cannot experience these affections if it is not altogether devoted to the lord keeping its gaze fixed upon his divine pleasure hearing of it with joy executing it with alacrity and forgetting its own inclination and conveniences the soul must be like the faithful servant who seeks to do only the will of his master and not his own this is the manner of obeying which is fruitful and which is due from all the creatures to their god and much more from all the religious who explicitly promise this kind of obedience in order that thou my dearest mayest attain to it perfectly remember what esteemed david in many places speaks of the precepts psalm 118 of the sayings and of the justifications of the lord and remember the effects which they caused in that prophet and even now in the souls he says that they will make the infants wise psalm eighteen verse eight rejoice the heart of men psalm eighteen verse nine that they enlighten the eyes of the soul so that they become a more brilliant light for its footsteps psalm one hundred eighteen verse one hundred five that they are more sweet than honey psalm eighteen verse eleven more desirable and more estimable than the most precious stones this promptitude and subjection to the divine will and to his laws made david so conformable to the heart of god these are the kind of souls his majesty seeks for his servants and friends first book of kings chapter thirteen verse fourteen acts of the apostles chapter thirteen verse twenty two attend therefore my daughter with all solicitude to the works of virtue and perfection which thou knowest to be desirable in the eyes of the lord despise none of them nor withdraw from any of them and cease not to exercise them no matter how violently thy inclinations and thy weakness should oppose their exercise trust in the lord and proceed to put them into execution and soon his power will overcome all difficulties soon thou wilt also know by happy experience how light is the burden and how sweet is the yoke of the lord matthew chapter eleven verse thirteen he did not deceive us when he spoke those words as might be argued by the tepid and the negligent who in their torpidity and distrust tacitly repudiate the truth of this statement i wish also that thou in order to imitate me in this perfection take notice of the favor which the divine condescension vouchsafed me in furnishing me with a most sweet love and affection for the creatures as participators in the divine goodness and existence in this love i sought to console alleviate and enliven all souls and by a natural compassion i procured all spiritual and corporeal goods for them to none of them no matter how great sinners they might have been did i wish any evil on the contrary i was urged by the great compassion of my tender heart to procure for them eternal salvation from this also arose my anxiety concerning the grief which was to grow out of my pregnancy to my spouse saint joseph for to him i owe more than to all other creatures tender compassion filled my heart especially for the suffering and the infirm and i tried to obtain some relief for all 
in these virtues then i wish that thou making use of the knowledge of them given to thee most prudently imitate me End of chapter 16